Hi, I'm Ali Patterson. In today's episode of The Paytech Show, we're going to be learning about the huge changes happening in the payments industry. Retail payments specifically have changed forever. Customer demand for enhanced, invisible and instant payments means that retail banks can no longer have their cake and eat it too when it comes to low value, high volume payments that the retail wings were used to. One technology that's at the heart of the process is payment tokenization. By securing, streamlining, and ultimately making payments simpler for consumers, the next generation might look back at how we used to buy things and laugh. Kind of like I would do now with postal orders and checks. To find out more, I brought in some payment specialists from around the world to discover how the new ecosystem can be both beneficial to the bank, the retailer, and the customer. Dialing in from Finland, we have our resident payment specialist, Yuka from Gisaka and Devrond to find out how payment tokenization is enabling this increasing demand for new exciting payment tech. Next up, we have Miles Dawson from payments company Adjun, which allows businesses to accept e-commerce, mobile and point of sale payments. Last but not least, from Square, one of my favorite companies, we have Koshalia Soma Sundrum, the company that is key to unlocking credit card payments for small to medium sized businesses. How have consumer expectations changed digital payments? We saw, particularly from the start of January going up to sort of April at the height of the pandemic, um, we saw a 15-fold increase in digital payments. I mean, that's again a, a massive, massive increase. Um, and by digital payments, we mean like taking payments over the phone, um, online, and also delivery. So I mentioned about payments as well as uh, sort of uh, the orders. Um, and businesses were adapting this really, really fast. Um, you know, and then so as a result of that, they were also moving to omni-channel offerings, right? It's a business model. Um, and it was really interesting to see this fast adoption, you know, people pivoting into the new world or new norm, so to speak. Now, fast forward that to today, right from that beginning. Um, you know, so we're seeing sellers um, selling to customers, you know, who have themselves gone to the new way of actually purchasing, right? Their purchasing preferences have actually also shifted um, as a result of that. And also it's the same thing applies to services as well. So I think we are going to, our view is that we are going to see selling both online and in person is going to last. I think it's, it's, it's a, probably a new norm. Um, and uh, many businesses you know, feel that actually online businesses are more accessible to customers as well, and it is more convenient. I think the first thing I'd say is what, what we've definitely seen over that five year period is payments move from being a commodity item that was on a CFO's cost budget that would regularly come in and beat someone up to get lower rates to now actually it quite often sits front and center in the tech stack and is, is something that gets thought about a lot sooner in the process because it's you know it's definitely seen as an item that can really help build the right customer journeys that shopper want at, at the same time as actually becoming a real barrier to innovation and, and global expansion um and and i think that i was obviously driven by by shopper needs so over that five-year period you know we've seen um obviously cards become more and more prevalent in in a lot of european uh countries but in your in in the uk where we're always a very card centric uh environment we've kind of seen more effective ways of delivering a card payment through through the likes of apple pay and google pay um you know we're starting to see some ideas around where open banking might might take that to the next level um we're we're certainly seeing buy now pay later come up in a, in a lot of uh retailers uh, and increasingly across different european centers so i think all of that is really being driven by the shopper and and i think what i'd say over time is there's just been this real demand for it to be a frictionless element within the shopper's journey um where i guess at some point you know uber probably cropped up in the last five years really didn't it and and that sort of totally changed the thinking of what payments could be in, in that it became nothing you know you, you stored your card when you set up your account and then you booked a taxi you got out of a taxi and some money was taken off you but in a such a seamless way and if you imagine 
you know, how, how does how does that app work if you've got some really clunk, clunky payment element as part of it? It's it's just not going to be the same. So I think you see that we see you know huge um, subscription businesses popping up everywhere. Um, again, very global in nature, and and that has driven again this sort of hidden payment. Really, you you pay once, you subscribe, the money comes off your card. What you don't want is, you know, your card expiring and suddenly you can't use Netflix and you can't figure out how to update it. So I think that's driven a lot of innovation from the schemes, which again is quite new in the last five years, really. You know, they they would typically be there creating this really solid, um, secure network across global banks. And actually now they're really building innovation on those rails to help support the business models that we're seeing, which are, which are kind of being driven by shoppers. What can tokenization do to enhance the customer experience? Mm. I think most important thing is that the people shouldn't worry about whether there is a technology called the tokenization, uh, because all we want to do is to, well, maybe pay, but more to buy. And then the payment is the necessary evil there in between. And uh, how this technically happens, uh, I think that's really important that uh, this is kind of a hidden from the co consumer. Uh, but at the same time, of course, technologies like tokenization, which enables that the, you from your to make a really a kind of concrete example, we all have our payment cards. It has the PAN number, which is the 16 digit number there. So that's really uh, the origin of everything. And tokenization is basically making uh, surrogates, digital surrogates out of that one. And you can have as many as you can uh, want to. You can put a few on your different wallets, your digital wallets like Apple Pay, Google Pay, maybe you can put one in, in your merchant A, B and so forth. And you can then manage them dynamically. If you lose, for example, your phone, you can disable that token, but all the other tokens, as well as your original card, still works. So there is a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, benefits out of that one. And then enhancing the consumer experience, one um, uh, good example is, for example, when you do the uh, e-commerce online. Uh, and uh, what happens today is that if I want to buy something uh, from a web shop, um, I store my card details there. So now with the tokenization, also all that information will be automatically updated. If my card, the real card expiry date is expiring, I get a new card. Okay, I can uh, continue payment, but actually on that online merchant, that old information is still there. But with the tokenization, it will be automatically updated there in the backend system without any involvement from the consumer, which means when I want to buy next time and I have now the renewed card, renewed tokens too, it continues automatically. I don't need to start re-entering my card. Uh, so small thing, but actually it is a big thing for the consumer week because we often then actually stop that payment transaction at the point when we need to start doing something extra. And it's even a bigger thing, of course, for the merchant, because then you have lost your customer. So there is a, a lot of these kind of, a, uh, let's say, capabilities that tokenization can provide. Um, and, and one of our early kind of big value propositions was, was card tokenization. Like we can tokenize your card and then you can do a one-click payment. And, you know, you, it's, it's really interesting that we're still talking about that eight years later. And I think we're talking about it because there's been so many iterations of, of being able to do that and do that really seamlessly. Um, and ultimately it's still doing, underpinning the same thing, which is like a one-click payment or a subscription payment. Um, or, or that kind of Uber model where it's almost like zero click. Um, but really what what tokenization is doing is, is kind of removing a lot of the PCI burden from the merchant and handing that over to the, the payment company who is effectively storing all of the card information and handing back a secure token so that when the shopper comes back and logs in, um, the, the, the kind of, you know, the retailer or the checkout is just passing that token back to the payment provider 
who who decrypts it and then uses card data through to the schemes to to create that transaction um so it, it's i guess a really secure way to enable um smaller retailers and um and different kind of business models to really seamlessly create a payment flow so generally speaking um you know it would be fair to say that tokenization brings broadly few benefits um you know it's expected to be more secure uh, better approval rates right as a result of that lowering the fraud um and also less card abandonment at the till um so you may ask like what are the practical you know things that we have seen as you know coming out of this tokenization for our customers right um i would say all of them are centered around security so security on the side of the card holder on one hand and security on the hand of also the sellers on the other hand so the security on the heart of the card holder is essentially um fueled by the fact that it significantly reduces the risk uh, for customers in terms of losing their data right because the number of parties who can actually see the data in in terms of a transaction is is going to be limited through that encryption um and you can you cannot really reverse that engineering to reveal the customer data so that's where the encryption comes to fall and the second thing is from a seller's perspective you know how does it benefit so if you think about it seller is able to in principle there is is making their businesses easier to access payments and what i mean by that is that we have standards like such as in you know, a pci pci data compliance standards right so by having a technology um that allows you to encrypt the data such that the hackers can't actually easily hack right makes it more pci compliant so again it benefits the merchants as a result of being able to swiftly get through a customer journey from start to end so i would say security is a key aspect of it with payment data becoming richer more information on there and consumers becoming aware of where their data is and becoming increasingly more savvy how can consumers gain more control of their of their information that is very uh, i would say tricky question because uh, first of all if we are individual so we have a individual preferences how we want to manage our data but uh, it's true that most of us uh, probably are quite sensitive uh, uh, our uh, data which is related to our personal uh, uh, needs uh one of them is payment for sure health is uh, an uh, another good example but most of us are really kind of a very sensitive that okay if it's a payment related data we don't want to give it to here and there but we want to somehow manage the challenge is of course that when you have a now where i don't say a thousands or but hundreds of use cases and the services that you are using and you if you want to get anything you need to uh, share this uh, one way uh, of course what what we see is again um, enabled for example by tokenization uh, because now if you have this let's say uh, in average uh, uh, people have something like if i recall like 20 plus services where they have stored their payment credentials their payment card especially that means that uh, uh, if i don't even know where they are that would be an added value that would give us some power back to me if i can with the one look they uh, see okay i have these 20 actually different services where i use this card um, the other thing is that okay can i also somehow manage these cards uh, these digital cards uh, for example, my banking app, which would have then the selection of these 20. And I can say, I don't want to use, for example, now this service for the next six months. I disable that one. And then whenever I uh, want to, I can also then enable that one. So resuming, suspending, uh, doing this. Uh, so that's one way, definitely, where we see. And uh, there is, for example, us provide uh, services uh, uh, or solution called Token Cockpit. It a little bit describes the name that it is a, uh, a capability given to the consumer that they can uh, uh, see and view all their cards. They can manage those cards. They can also actually send 
these cards in different places. Like if I have my, let's say, a new service that I want to have, a, uh, I, I've never been using, for example, uh, let's say Amazon, and I would like to enable my payment there, I can just click the button and uh, actually my card is available for Amazon. So this would be, of course, a great use. And then at the same time, if I would have some concerns on that, I could disable, I could even terminate that card or if, if I wish to do so. I think one one of the things we've seen during the pandemic is actually a quicker migration to digital. So, you know, people that were maybe um, not quite sure and still really keen to go in store and, and didn't want to kind of save their card, um, that really seems to have moved on now because there was a period really where you couldn't do anything unless you did it digitally and and once you started doing that you could really see the benefits of actually stuff arriving on your doorstep you know really easy to buy loads of things off amazon with one click and so i think i don't know about customers getting their payment data back but i think people are more comfortable actually providing it so long as in return they receive that really slick journey that means they don't have to keep rushing into another room to grab their wallet or find a card so um and, e and even in you know even in stores i think um you know the, the the uptake of apple pay and google pay is really has really increased obviously in supermarkets more than retail um and again i think you know you're really saving your your card data onto your device which is heavily encrypted tokenized and um and lives elsewhere but i think people are really comfortable doing that now and, and especially although i saw yesterday they've upped the limit to 100 pound now which i think will be super interesting but almost uh, you know i think the horse is bolted right everyone realized i can use apple pay up to anything i want so that the the adoption of paying by by phone i think has really really increased there's more willingness to to give away some information because the returns that you're getting especially during the pandemic have been really significant well that's all we've got time for on today's episode of the paytech show i'd like to thank our guests for their time and for you the viewer too you can catch the rest of the paytech show over at fintechf.com and of course on youtube and linkedin bye for now <laughs>